So we go to the second subject and the subject under the radar this time is uh, nephrology. So let us just try to see how the paper stands with respect to nephrology. Last time around in 2022 we had a very fair representation as far as this whole science is concerned but this time around the representation is pretty poor. In fact, it is very dismal. We had only few questions in nephrology this time. I am not happy with the board with respect to the number of questions and the questions are very basic, need PG standard only. And as far as the whole uh, preparation is concerned, uh, for anybody dwelling into preparation, you are aspiring only for NEET SS and not for INI, you need not again watch the NEET SS, uh, sorry, the subject videos of Nephro, the medicine videos under Nephrology, which would probably come to around 15 hours is more than enough. And as we have stressed on, the majority questions are generally from basics or from glomerulus. These are the two areas from very good questions. Let us see the questions now. Uh, 33 year old male uh, rushed to the casualty for four episodes of seizures. Okay, found to have a bun of 131, which means urea is 262, very high. And so probably uremic, creatinine of 13.6, oh my God, very high. BP was 198, 120. So yes, very likely to be a uremic seizure, one chance, or likely to be press related also because it's 191, 198, 120. Urine showed albumin 3 plus and RBC is plenty, which means I am bringing the diagnosis down to the glomerulus, so it's nothing much. Kidney size was very small and CMD was partially low. So, it is a glomerulus, it is a chronic glomerulonephritis, most likely cause for a chronic glomerulonephritis. Membranous can produce, MPGN can produce, IG can produce, FSDS can produce, but most common cause for chronic glomerulonephritis per se, if you look at all the glomerular diseases in our country, worldwide, everywhere, without any doubt whatsoever, is IGA. So, it is a basic simple question on a CGN and what is the most likely cause for a CGN. Most likely cause for a CGN is always IGA. Some people ask me about FSDS. FSDS can go into CKD, but how many times is FSDS directly present as a CKD? This is a direct straight shot presentation of CKD. See, under membranes, I discussed 70 30. You know, 70 percent are asymptomatic, 30 percent are going to come with nephrotic syndrome. Under MPGN, we discussed about 35 35 20 10, where I told you 10 percent can come with the CKD, but IJ is far, far more common than that. MPGN, we see maybe three cases a year, IJ, we see 300 cases in an OP. So, it is extremely, extremely different. And as far as FSGs is concerned, the presentations are again 75 25, and we have discussed that again under our basic approach to a glomerular disease where this is very clear. Somebody who has worked in a ward, somebody who has seen few patients, this is a jujube question. Right, type 2 DM clinical situation, proteinuria 3 plus, ultrasound kidney uh, normal size, no loss of CMD, creatinine normal, urea normal, which is the following does not support the need for a renal biopsy. So, when do you do a renal biopsy in a patient who is basically having a diabetic kidney disease? So, when you have a diabetic kidney disease, you look for certain set of things. When that is not satisfied, then you probably do a biopsy. What are you expecting in a patient with a diabetic kidney disease? You are expecting edema. Edema initially on and off edema and then of course sustained edema. You are expecting nephrotic range of proteinuria. You are not expecting any nephrotic syndrome, but you are expecting nephrotic range of proteinuria. You are expecting hypertension. You are expecting retinopathy. So, you are expecting nephrotic range of proteinuria without syndrome, you are expecting hypertension, you are expecting retinopathy, you are expecting edema. When this is there, you say that of course, this is equal to diabetic nephropathy. If this is not there, then probably you may have to reconsider your diagnosis and think twice. And then that may actually go in favor of doing a biopsy. Let us see the options. 24 hour protein, 18 gram per day. This is nephrotic range. So, does it support the need for a biopsy? Uh, 18 gram means I am little not convinced because 18 is a little too much. So, we will keep there. Active urinary sediments are not seen in diabetic nephropathy. So, when you are having active urinary sediments, 100 percent you have to go for a biopsy, no doubt about it. Sudden and rapid fall in your GFR. Sudden and rapid fall in your GFR again is not a part, not part and parcel of diabetic nephropathy. It has its own slow pace, correct. So, not slow pace per se, but still its own pace. So, sudden rapid fall, definitely I will do a biopsy. So, these two things I am definitely going to do a biopsy, no doubt about it. Presence of retinopathy. Presence of retinopathy is something that is expected. So, 100 percent you are expecting that no, in type 1 and 65 percent you are expecting it in type 2. Because you do not see retinopathy, then of course, alarm bells are ringing and you are suddenly taken off guard and you may actually go into a biopsy. But if you see retinopathy, then you are happy. You just is sinking in with, in, just actually sinking with your original diagnosis. So, there is nothing to be worried about. So, presence of retinopathy, I will never do a biopsy. 18 gram per day, sometimes I might. Because I say nephrotic range, I am happy means I am expecting say maximum 6 gram, 7 gram. The moment you are getting 10 gram, 12 gram, 15 gram means it is out of picture. Maybe amyloid or something, I am not convinced. So, 18 grams is too much of proteinuria. So, that is the reason why this I may actually do biopsy. So, if you are asking me when will you do biopsy in a case of diabetic kidney disease, I will definitely say the absence of a proteinuria 100 percent I will do. Nephrotic syndrome presentation I will do. Too much of proteinuria I may do. Uh, absence of retinopathy I may do. Absence of hypertension, absence of edema I may do. So, it is exactly what we have discussed in the diabetic kidney disease and this is to tell you that this is something that is along the expected lines. 
Although I am lecturing on this a little too much, even without any of these things, I think majority would have answered this question because this is something which is a very basic uh, word discussion. These kind of questions are problematic to students who come from anesthesia and pediatric background. They are the people who suffer with this because for a medicine person, this is a very easy question. For the anesthesia pediatric person, because they have not attended medicine ward rounds, they may find it a little tough. But if you watch the basic approach to kidney disease and watch that module on diabetic nephropathy, I think that would settle it for once and all. That is question number two. Drug which has got maximum cardiovascular mortality benefit in diabetic kidney disease. This is a very commonly asked question, very, very commonly asked question because the landscape of managing diabetes has shifted from a glycemic control to how you achieve better outcomes with respect to cardiovascular mortality morbidity status. That is the reason why this question keeps on getting repeated and even in December 2023, we had the ADA guidelines for 24 being released and even ADA has emphasized and re-emphasized on need to actually look into drugs which would give you better outcomes with respect to cardiovascular and renal mortality benefit. That's the reason why this question has been asked and you can actually see this. Atherosclerotic vascular disease and heart failure, you are looking for the benefit. So, metformin is potential benefit, okay. SGLT2 inhibitors, benefit, benefit. GLP-1 agonist, benefit here, potential benefit. Others are all neutral, neutral, neutral. Thiazole and ions, potential benefit, but heart failure increases, so he is out. So, the only two things which have definite benefit as far as atherosclerotic vascular disease are concerned are SGLT2 inhibitors and your GLP-1 analogs. And the exam question was on SGLT2. And SGLT2 would any day be little better than GLP-1 because one cost of course, oral of course versus IV and the fact that heart failure, this is one among the four drugs which are called as fantastic four in heart failure. So, what are the drugs coming out of fantastic four in heart failure? Beta blockers are there, SGLT2 inhibitors are there, aldosterone antagonists are there. Okay, and ARNI which is your angiotensin receptor nephrolysin inhibitor. So, these are the four fantastic four. So, this question, the answer for this question is STLT2 and this again is a very basic fine year understanding, second year level understanding. So again for students from medicine background, this is easy. Others have to once again watch this and come into scheme which is not a ECG finding in hyperkalemia. This is another little debated question. This is definitely a debatable question because I am uh, showing you this table from Fihali, another table from uh, Brenner which are nephrology books and Nishan has actually shown you tables from his books uh, which are basically Topal as well as your brown world. Those books have actually given different values. So, I am sticking to these values because I am damn sure this question has been framed from this table. That is why those options are in sync. So, 6 to 7 you get the first finding which is tall peaked T waves. 7 to 8 you are going to get a flattening of the P wave, prolongation of the PR interval, depression of the ST segment and your uh, T waves are going to be still peaked. 8 to 9 you are going to get atrial standstill, prolonged QRS duration and more than 9 absence of P wave which is called as a sine wave pattern. So, in general parlance how do you actually study this? You study this as the first change is at all peak to T wave which you see somewhere between 6 to 7. 7 to 8 you are going to get those catchy findings, PR interval, ST segment depression and of course 8 to 9 you get this widening of the QRS and more than 9 you get the sine wave. So, tall T waves, wide QRS, depressed ST are all correct. Short QT is what uh, I feel is the answer but you can quote cardiology textbook and say that short QT may be seen but I am very sure short QT is the answer because short QT is very characteristically seen in hypercalcemia. So, the examiner wants you to know what are the catch findings in hyperkalemia and the one which is not seen there and that is short QT which is seen in hypercalcemia and long QT which is seen in hypocalcemia. So, for all practical purposes thinking on behalf of the examiner I fix the answer as uh, short QT but again uh, debatable. I once again tell you that the reference here is uh, Fihali's textbook of nephrology and this is Brenner and Brenner you actually see Brenner also really does not mention about QT per se. So, I think it is a better answer. What causes dynamic bone disease? This is another big talking point. So, people who know about this talking point will definitely say, we beg and beg with physicians to actually not write vitamin D, not write calcium. Why? Because general parlance, a CKD patient is likely to develop a high bone turnover disease. That is what is very common. But we are now inducing a lot of dynamic bone disease, which is what I call as a low bone turnover state. What is the meaning of a low bone turnover state? A low bone turnover state means that your parathormone levels are actually speaking less than 200. Because there is a PTH resistance, we expect PTH to be minimum 2 to 7 times or maybe say 4 to 7 times the upper limit of normal in CKD. But here PTH is actually very low. Why is PTH very low? Because there is so much of calcium. This calcium is actually suppressing PTH. From where are you getting all this calcium? Are you taking calcium? No. You are getting exogenous calcium from drugs. 
anyone and everyone who sees a CKD patient prescribes calcium, calcium, calcium and he keeps on taking this calcium and vitamin D which is again enhancing calcium. This is going to actually speaking suppress your PTH and this is going to be associated with widespread calcific deposits everywhere and it's a very very bad form and you see this in elderly females, diabetic females etc and that is adenomic bone disease. Adenomic bone disease is caused by excess calcium, calcium, calcium and that's the reason why it is characterized by vascular and soft tissue calcification. Yeah, school runs off tissue calcification. So that's why I often emphasize on the need to understand that the killer in CKD is phosphorus and calcium. And why phosphorus? Because phosphorus converts endothelial cells to osteoblasts. You never want phosphorus to increase. Second is adenomicity. And adenomic bone disease is part and parcel of supplementing calcium from outside. So what can we do to these patients? We basically have only very limited options to cut off calcium. That's why adenomic bone disease is a terrible, terrible disease. High bone turnover is something that we expect. Low bone turnover is something we don't expect. But we are seeing a lot of low bone turnover cases right now. Why are we seeing low bone turnover cases? Because we are supplementing calcium, supplementing calcium and that goes and suppresses PTH. Okay, it's a simple question. You don't need a nephrology level understanding for this. If you are somewhere in a medicine ward and you have seen few CKD patients, you will be knowing this. If you have not seen anything and you watched medicine videos per se, there is a different different module, specific module called CKD MBD. Even if you have not watched that CKD mineral bone disease module, general CKD understanding in the beginning, I think I would have stressed on this four or five times. Okay, 15 year old girl, asymptomatic microhematuria, normal kidney function test, a similar history of kidney disease in the mother and elder sister who never need a renal replacement therapy. Simple question, asymptomatic microscopic hematuria in a child is equal to Alport syndrome unless proven otherwise. Alport syndrome will be definitely running in families. You will be getting the history of RRT requirement and transplant in the family. When you have Alport like presentation, why we do biopsy in Alport is because we want to rule out this disease, which is an autosomal dominant disease, which has got extremely good prognosis, which is running in families, but there are no external manifestations. There is no requirement for RRT. There is no requirement for transplant. And that very, very close computer of Alport is what we call thin GBM disease. Okay, everybody understood this is not Alport, but some idiots uh, did mark it as IgA. I'll just hit on your head if you mark it as IgA because it's nothing like IgA. There is no proteinuria, there is no RBC. It is sympharyngitic episodic macroscopic hematuria. It's not at all like this. Fabry is no way like this and Fabry has angiokeratomas, acroparesthesias, nothing like that. So, essentially it is thin GBM disease. First line therapy for lupus nephritis, of course, I mean, there is no discussion required. One of the most easiest questions in the paper. Another question which some people felt is a confusing one is next step after abdominal pain in a case of membranous. Membranous is notorious for thrombosis. The moment you have thrombosis, you have to do an investigation. So what is the next step or what is the most definitive? Most definitive will be MR angiography or a CT angiogram. You can actually do CT or MR angiogram. Uh, if you ask me, I would say that generally what we do is CT angio more, but MR is theoretically a little better. But what is the next step? step means of course USD with renal vein doppler that is what we all do as the next step and then of course definitely investigation is the CTRA or a MRA but if you are asking me what is that you do when you are having a transplant patient also we get this right or even with membranes you get this abdominal pain you are thinking in terms of abdominal pain macroscopic hematuria naturally RVT RVT the first thing is to do a ultrasound not do ultrasound alone ultrasound with doppler 19 year old female is actually presenting to you with abdominal pain no skin lesions and dark urine on standing this is actually speaking the first sentence that we have discussed under approach to macrohematuria. I showed you a bottle where there is high colored urine and I asked you what will you do when you have this. So the first thing you do is to actually do a uh, um, urine dipstick. And if dipstick is coming as positive, then you know it is blood, correct? And blood means you know it is RBC, it can be uh, hemoglobin, it can be myoglobin. But there is a possibility that dipstick is negative. And what did I tell you? When you are having hematuria with the dipstick negative, there is only one answer in the world and that is porphyria, porphyria, porphyria. This is a clear case of porphyria. Abdominal pain, female and all are add on things, but whenever you are having blood, First thing you think of is porphyria. When dipstick is positive, then of course RBCs and hemoglobin, myoglobin. Then you centrifuge and I told you RBCs will settle down at the bottom and the supernatural will become clear. Then further on how to differentiate hemoglobin, myoglobin. Myoglobin has a short half-life. Everything we have discussed. But our first elementary understanding as far as approach to a person with a high colored urine is concerned, primarily it is focusing on dipstick. And if dipstick is negative, you think of porphyria. So anyone and everyone who has seen the video will be knowing this. It's a very basic question. So none of these things have been asked outside what we have discussed under medicine. So nephrology SS videos, even if you have skipped completely, there is nothing that's going to happen. Neat SS questions can be very easily answered at the basic medical level understanding. So nephrology has a poor representation this time. Questions are very easy, but little tricky here and there, not like romat, which are purely fact based. You need to be knowing certain catch points in these questions, but that depends on your understanding. So that's why I feel people who are from a non-medicine background might actually feel a little, little tough. 
But for that, they have to just come into sync with the videos. It's just around, I think, 14 hours, 15 hours of videos. If you just fall in sync with that, I think automatically that's going to be a kind of a easy ride. And uh, for people preparing from now on, again, I, you have to watch the entire nephrology under medicine, but the onus has to be always on basics, approach to glomerular disease, urine analysis, and all those two, uh, five, six set of basic videos, and then glomerular diseases per se. You can see vascular, tubular interstitium, transplant, dialysis, they've not asked any questions from anywhere. So the onus is definitely on the basics only. Thank you so much.